um, at a time when sheltering in place is paramount to stabilizing the United States and controlling the pandemic, our country is on the brink of a housing crisis of unprecedented magnitude and with no safety net beneath us. Uh, COVID-19 struck at a time when we were already at a housing crisis. 20.5 million families struggled to scrape the rent together and only one in four, so 25% of eligible renters actually received federal financial assistance and they were eligible. That means that many people did not qualify for, or did not receive housing subsidies even though they were qualified. So between the scarcity of federal housing assistance and the loss of 4 million affordable housing units over the last decade, renters were increasingly vulnerable to eviction coming into the pandemic. To put this in perspective, seven evictions were filed every minute in 2016. That was when the average national unemployment rate was 4.7%. Today, as you know, unemployment is nearly four times that level and expected to keep fluctuating upwards. So why can we expect eviction to increase? Underscoring the immense toll of the pandemic, 50 million renters today live in households that suffered COVID-19 related job loss or income loss. And 40% of that occurred in especially low income households. In, in addition, the demand for, finan for financial assistance is at an all-time high. There was a 92% increase in daily rental assistance requests from this time last year, and programs are being exhausted within minutes of being opened for rental assistance. In addition, food pantry requests have increased by as much as 2,000% in some states. So this demonstrates that renters are really stretched to pay the rent first, and other things are being set aside, like food, necessities, healthcare, and otherwise. Renters are also taking on credit card and loan debt just to make ends meet and pay the rent. Uh, a new analysis of the U.S. Census House Pulse Survey by Stout, Rhesus, and Ross that came out today estimates that approximately 16.9 million households, many of which contain numerous adults and children, are unable to pay the rent and at risk of eviction. Another study by the Aspen Institute found that 20 to 24 million renters will be facing eviction by the end of September. So again, to put this in perspective, 10 million people were displaced from their homes over a course of years following the foreclosure crisis of 2008. We are on track to surpass that number in just four months. Renters of color, especially Black and Latinx renters, are at the highest risk. These populations have experienced COVID-19 job loss, infection, and death at much higher rates than other demographics, and they consistently report low confidence in their ability to pay the rent during this pandemic. The steep decline in rent payments will also have a devastating impact across the housing market, especially among small property owners who lack the financial ability to sustain short and long-term non-payment of rent. Individual investors, so small property owners, own approximately 22.7 million out of the 48.5 million rental units in the country. The Harvard University Joint Center on Housing Studies estimates that 20% of renters in these units may have difficulty paying the rent. These are the types of units that we will lose in the housing market that will decrease affordable housing and end up crippling that entire system, depleting it as well. In response to the increasing risk of eviction, state and local governments issued moratoriums and the federal government passed the CARES Act, which created a moratorium on federally assisted housing and also had temporary unemployment insurance. These prevented widespread eviction between March and July but these are also expiring at the end of July, along with the majority of state issued moratoriums. And this is before states have developed and implemented strategies to really support property owners and renters to weather this storm. So today, less than half of the states have a state level eviction moratorium and 29 states received less than one out of five stars on the housing policy scorecard that I created with the eviction lab at Princeton University. This means that evictions that were on hold will be executed and new evictions will be filed. Michigan's moratorium, for example, expired this week and they expect 80,000 eviction filings now. The majority of courts have moved to remote hearings, which also raises questions about a tenant's ability to exercise their right to be heard. Between the technology divide, the lack of minutes on their phone, the ability to pay for their phone or access a computer when they can't pay the rent, as well as language barriers and others create significant due process concerns. So what does this mean for renters and for society? Well, eviction has negative consequences that result in high community and healthcare expenditures. Just the notice of eviction can increase rates of stress, anxiety, and depression. 
Renters with eviction filings on their record are often blocked out of the renter market by landlords, even if they ultimately won their case. Eviction results in failing credit scores. It forces families into rental housing with substandard conditions that pose a threat to their health and safety. And it almost always leads to a downward move to run down housing, to disadvantage higher crime neighborhoods, homelessness, academic decline, no good outcome from eviction. And these outcomes cost communities and taxpayers far more than the price of addressing the affordable housing crisis itself. Uh, in, in places like California, the risk of eviction has resulted in a rise in the creation of unions. Uh, renters have started to protest, demanding cancel the rent or rent relief. And the formation of these tenant unions in buildings and communities was designed to really organize and increase tenant bargaining power. They're, they've had early successes, including rent control ordinances. Um, ultimately, the pandemic magnified and heightened the socioeconomic divide and the health and racial disparities and shredded the already threadbare safety net in America. State leaders, federal leaders have an unparalleled opportunity to address these outcomes and their root causes to ensure that the new post-pandemic reality is one in which health justice, racial justice, and housing justice are realized. Some of the statistics have demonstrated that there's a disproportionate impact on, many of the studies have demonstrated that there's a disproportionate impact on Black and Latinx renters who have experienced COVID-19 job or wage loss at much higher rates. In fact, uh, Black renters experienced it at 44% and Hispanic at 61%, whereas white households were only a fraction of that at 38%. In addition, they also demonstrate a lack of emergency funds to cover three months of expenses. Nearly 75% of Black and Latino renters said that they did not have those emergency funds over three months as compared to only 47% of white renters. And these trends have continued throughout the pandemic. Uh, and this is largely due to a longstanding uh, loss of wealth and wealth accumulation and affordable housing throughout our history, um, especially due to discriminatory zoning laws and other policies that have really blocked communities of color out of that kind of forward movement. And they also lost all of the gains that, that they made in homeowner, homeownership and other areas uh, due to predatory lending and other outcomes of the 2008 foreclosure crisis. Eviction often leads to housing instability and homelessness. And so families rarely are able to locate equal living situations. So they end up doubled up in overcrowded settings or in homeless shelters. And all of these are places where people cannot safely social distance, where there just isn't the space to do that. And we know that COVID-19, uh, the risk of COVID-19 is related to contact. So the inability to social distance, to safely shelter in place could expose families who are evicted to COVID-19 at higher rates and really spur an increase in that contraction rate. Um, in, in terms of the property owners, so many of the property owners who will be affected by non-payment of rent are small property owners who don't have the financial cushion to wait for a new renter. And so what may happen is that the housing market itself will be depleted and these units will actually be taken off the market um, or repurposed for something else as opposed to being re-rented by a different tenant. Um, Governor Hogan was one of the uh, few Republican governors to actually act decisively and crisply at the very beginning of this. Uh, he implemented by executive order um, our first uh, eviction moratorium in mid-March. Also, uh, uh, we have had a, a moratorium on late fees and utility turnoffs. Now, um, my committee had an, a pretty extensive briefing where we invited um, all the stakeholders, tenant advocacy groups, the business community, the banking community. And um, we found that they were uncharacteristically united in their belief that more money had to be committed to rental assistance. So uh, I and my vice chair, the vice chair of the committee that I'm the chairman of, uh, wrote a letter to the governor and we asked for the governor to extend the moratorium until January 31st, which would give us time to get back in the session to work with the administration to craft a more permanent public policy response to the to, to the constellation of issues here. Uh, we emphasized the fact that we wanted um, 
uh, a lot more money from the CARES Act to be dedicated to temporary rental assistance. And, um, you know, the view that we take, uh, that at least um, the majority of my committee members take and the Speaker of the House takes, is that, um, you know, it, typically in Montgomery County, Maryland, where I live, maybe one quarter of 1% to one half of 1% of the population is evicted. If you up that to 10% or 15%, you suddenly have a problem that's not just falling within the dry confines of landlord-tenant uh, contract law. What we're talking about in that instance would be a full-scale social disruption. I think from the perspective of landlords, it would be you know, most landlords, look, I mean, I know tenant advocates don't have this attitude. Most landlords have no interest in evicting people summarily. I mean, tenants who stay and pay is how they make their living. But, you know, this situation is going to catch a lot of property owners in a very tough situation. On the one hand, you know, the minute you evict somebody, you're going to have to spend a lot of money to prepare the property for the next renter if there is a next renter. And so um, it's our hope that we will work with the administration to craft a, a more permanent solution to this, uh, to this situation. For right now, though, um, everybody's on pins and needles. Nobody knows. You know, there are so many uh, unknowns. We don't know you know, what the budgetary numbers of revenues are going to be like for the state of Maryland between uh, now and January. We don't know who the next president of the United States is going to be. That'll, of course, be determined in early November, and that would color a lot of our um, policy uh, directions. So, you know, I, I think right now what we need to do is we need to put the economy in stasis, if that's possible, to hit the pause button. I think it's important, not just for tenants, but also for property owners and for small businesses who are right now worrying about being kicked out of their um, uh, place of business as well. So this is, this is a problem that if we allow a large proportion of the population to be evicted, we could have a revolution on our hands. I mean, I think it's, it, it it is not hyperbolic to look at it in those terms. And I'll close with one um, thing that I saw on in the press, CNBC, which I've never thought of as being a particularly left-wing commercial organization. CNBC reported that early in the month of July, as many as 32% of the American public had not paid some or all of their rent. Now, if these folks start getting evicted in August and in September, the whole term rental tsunami, eviction tsunami is going to come true and that's going to be a very ugly situation. And I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, even I'm a, I'm a Democrat and I tend to be pretty liberal, but I'm also very pro free market and I tend to be very pro business, but this is not a business issue. This is a social welfare issue at this point because evicting 10% of the population would be a humanitarian catastrophe, the likes of which would take us a very long time to recover from. Um, the homelessness crisis um, uh, has been a crisis for a long time in the United States, and it's primarily a crisis that um, disproportionately impacts people of color, particularly Black Americans and Indigenous Americans, who are um, overrepresented in the homeless population by factors of four to eight. Um, the homelessness crisis, while often portrayed as a crisis of mental health and substance use, is and has always been a crisis of the um, devastating lack of affordable housing of the effects of structural racism and of the um, and of income inequality full scale. The uh, COVID crisis has both increased the costs of homelessness, um, as you may have heard about um, devastating outbreaks of COVID in congregate shelters, of um, much more um, difficulties for people facing homelessness who are not in shelter because of closure of food programs and, and libraries and other places where people could seek some form of mild relief. Um, 
Um, and there has been um, some effort um, through the federal government to, um, to um, try to solve um, or, or bring resources to people currently experiencing homelessness. Many of us, including me, are extremely worried about the other problem and the feeling of that if we focus our efforts on homelessness on people who are currently homeless, it is like um, leaking, uh, um, it is like trying to bail a leaking ship um, because we know that um, we cannot solve homelessness merely by focusing on the people who are currently homeless homeless. There are current estimates that there will be increases in homelessness on the order of 20 to 40 percent unless decisive action will be taken through the crises that we're talking about um, currently. What will happen to families and households when they become evicted? For many, as um, Emily Bemfer noticed, uh, noted, that people leave um, eviction and move to less stable housing. They double up with others. They enter into crowded households. But for many, they fall directly from eviction into homelessness. Or for others, they move into these overcrowded housing where things are unstable. And after a period of a year or two, they eventually fall into homelessness. This is where our concerns um, lie. Right now, um, what would happen if you became homeless is more complicated than it's ever been. In um, about 50% of Americans who are homeless are sheltered. On the West Coast, it's only about um, a third of people are in shelters when they're homeless. Homeless shelters have become decided more um, uh, worrisome because of the impacts of COVID and thus um, many places have, um, have really decreased access to shelter. So you see rises in unsheltered homelessness because of the difficulty of having um, shelters. We worry that there will be dramatic increases in unsheltered homelessness. There have been responses um, throughout, uh, you know, for instance, California has had a program called Project Room Key, which has provided hotel rooms to individuals individuals who are particularly vulnerable to dying from COVID. Um, this program, though, just to give you a sense of scale, has successfully housed, uh, placed about 15,000 homeless individuals into hotel rooms out of about 150,000 homeless people who already existed in California. The governor of California just announced Project Home Key, which will provide $600 million to try to acquire properties, um, many of these, these hotels that are currently being used to provide housing. But again, this will be a drop in the bucket for the people who are currently experiencing homelessness and will not address um, the new inflows into homelessness. What would it take to end homelessness in this country? It has to be a dramatic expansion of extremely low income housing, as well as a dramatic expansion of rental support. There is um, the HEROES Act, which has passed the House, but is being held up by the Senate, would provide dramatic rental um, relief funds, but it is not going um, through um, right now. Currently, um, pre-pandemic, only one in four households in this country who met the strict criteria for rental relief from the federal government received it because it is a limited resource. The cost to fully fund that is about $31 billion a year. We currently spend about $12 billion on shelter, but we leave most homeless people who are homeless um, unsheltered, um, just again, give you a sense of scale. So I think, um, you know, being that this is a problem that so disproportionately affects um, people of color, particularly Black and Indigenous Americans, we anticipate that the eviction crisis will um, disproportionately um, impact those communities as well. And we are anticipating at the very worst time we possibly could have um, dramatic increases in homelessness. But when children are evicted, they have um, severe, you know, it causes um, disruptions in schooling and disruptions in education, mental health problems, etc. I will say that family homelessness um, and actually and, and sort of the equivalent of homelessness in Latinx populations often looks a little different than it does for single adults, that families often will do everything that they can to avoid showing up in shelter systems or in unsheltered settings because children get removed from households. And so there's a little bit of a definitional issue here where um, many families who really would be homeless but are not counted as homeless because what they are is living in extraordinarily overcrowded housing situations because those families are doing everything that they can to avoid showing up in the homeless system because of the risk that the children will be removed 
removed from the families. We will say that we are seeing this crisis of COVID um, very much disproportionately affecting, as you know, Black, Native, and um, Latinx households. And in, in Latinx communities, what we're seeing is extraordinary overcrowding of housing. You know, 12 people sharing a room or a bathroom, which is obviously extremely dangerous for um, for purposes of COVID, um, but may not be counted as homeless because they don't meet the federal definition of homelessness. We see that a lot with households with children, where they will, instead of sort of popping into the shelter system or into the streets, will instead have these extraordinarily um, overcrowded conditions, which are not safe for COVID, nor are they safe for mental health, emotional health, schooling, or any of the other issues. In this country right now, there are about 35 or 36 units of housing that are available and affordable for every 100 extremely low-income households. Extremely low-income households are households that make 30% or less of the area median income. When you talk about states like California, we're at 23 units per every 100 extremely low-income households. That is why we have the homelessness crisis. And so um, I, you know, I think that there have been discussions of not only um, funding the um, voucher system, the rental relief, you know, through um, housing choice vouchers, but also um, putting more money into the um, preservation and production and protection of, of deeply affordable housing. Um, so we've talked about the looming eviction crisis as a tsunami. And that metaphor, I think, is intended to capture the magnitude of the crisis. But I want to be really clear that it is this is not a natural disaster. It's a it's a it will be a disaster of our own making. And the good news about that, though, is that there's nothing inevitable about this crisis. Um, I think, like Emily alluded to earlier, to prevent it, we need to advocate for meaningful governmental intervention. Um, and I won't say that that's easy, but it's something that's going to be necessary if we want to avoid. Uh, avoid the crisis that is coming towards us pretty fast and furious. So before I describe the current statewide eviction moratorium in California, I'm going to give you a brief background on evictions in California, and then I'll talk about the statewide uh, policies that we're advocating for to prevent mass evictions as the unemployment rates continue to climb and more and more of California's estimated 17 million renters become unable to pay their rents. So in California, by law, landlords must go through a court process to evict tenants. The process is designed to be very efficient and really to provide consistent results for landlords to be able to eject tenants from prop uh, and recover their properties. And there's often very little regard for outcome for the tenants. Eviction lawsuits are fast-tracked. Nearly 75% of eviction cases are resolved within 45 days of filing and nearly 60% of those are resolved within one month. So I just want to highlight how, how quick they are. When a tenant is served with an eviction lawsuit, the tenant has only five days to file a response in court or risk losing their case and therefore their homes by default. So in, and in, the, in the vast majority of eviction cases, landlords are represented by attorneys and the vast majority of tenants are not represented. And because of this, even when a tenant has strong defenses to an eviction, if they don't have an attorney, they're more than likely going to lose their case. Now, because evictions proceed so quickly and there are so few resources for low-income tenants to get meaningful help when an eviction is filed, evictions have played a significant role in creating California's affordable housing crisis and our homelessness crisis. I know that you've heard statistics about this from the previous presenters, but before the pandemic, um, eight out of 10 extremely low income households and over five out of 10 very low income renters were paying more than half their income in, uh, in rent. Uh, some say 90, uh, some, some households paid 90% of their income towards rent. And communities of color disproportionately bear these crises with black, Latinx and immigrant households significantly more rent burden than white households. So even before COVID-19, people have been struggling to pay the rent and to stay housed in California. Now, the California Judicial Council, which is the body that regulates the court system in our state, adopted a temporary emergency rule on April 6th that effectively stops the courts from processing evictions during the state of emergency. 
there is uh, related to COVID-19. There's a limited exception for cases in which courts make findings that uh, there's a health and safety reason to proceed with the eviction, although those are rare. I wanna note that the rule does not suspend the tenant obligation to pay rent. It is also temporary. The rule expires uh, by its own terms. The rule expires three months after the COVID-19 state of emergency ends. Hasn't ended yet in California, but the court officials have indicated that they could end it earlier than that. They could end it now if they wanted to. Meanwhile, as of April 1st, more than 80 California cities and counties have adopted tenant protections, including temporary bans on evictions. They're very unique to each city and county and the details really vary. Um, what's important to note is when that, that threshold of that, or that, that floor for all Californians is lifted by the Judicial Council, then tenants are going to have to kind of navigate these uh, additional tenant protections, uh, you know, based on what city or county that they live in. And, um, and a lot of, uh, they're for the most part going to need to go to court to show that they that the, these individual, the, the local protections apply to their particular circumstances. Um, now, despite the statewide moratorium and local tenant protections, we have heard reports of landlords still attempting to displace tenants from housing using a variety of methods, including calling the police, trying to trick tenants into, um, into leaving by serving them with papers that look like they've been issued by the court but haven't, or simply by changing the locks. I want to stress that all of these methods are illegal. And in the instance of calling the police on tenants, um, you know, I, we we're having a national conversation on the, you know, relationship between police and communities of color and particularly black communities. So we can even, this, this behavior is actually dangerous in many instances. Now, landlord groups are also fighting, um, their associations are fighting uh, eviction protections in court and have been attempting to challenge these rules. We're confident though that the emergency measures for, uh, that the local governments and that the state court leaders have taken are necessary and reasonable in light of the pandemic. But we do need to think about what we need to do to help people stay in their homes when these temporary measures end and tenants have to pay rent owed. So for that reason, um, and just the fact that the mass, that's massive un unemployment rates and limited government aid, uh, which you know, the other presenters have covered in detail, when the rule is withdrawn and the moratorium lifts, we expect this, this massive eviction crisis. And if we allow the evictions to simply start again without any long-term assistance, it's gonna have a devastating impact on renters and in particular communities of color, right? So for that reason, Western Center, um, we're co-sponsoring uh, legislation as Assembly Bill 1436, which is called the COVID-19 Eviction Prevention and Housing Stability Act. Um, at core, this uh, legislation is, is designed to give tenants a fair chance to pay, rent, pay back rent owed and preserve the ability of landlords to pursue unpaid rent through civil actions as opposed through, through, through the eviction process which is currently the case for unpaid rent that is more than a year old. It also contains protections for tent renters from negative impacts to credit and, the ability, uh, and therefore the ability to rent in the future. So this, this legislation is, is a chance for communities, AB 1436 is a chance for communities and individuals to tell their state legislators here in California to stop the looming wave of evictions to keep us all safe and housed. Um, it is, I want to stress, the first step of many that we need to take to bring more equity into housing, uh, housing in California, but this is a great way for people to become engaged. And I also want to touch on, you know, the fact that uh, there, you know, renters groups have been forming, um, Emily mentioned renters unions, um, uh, tenant unions. Um, these are important ways for people to, uh, to basically important ways to create people power to um, to advocate for tenants, um, which is, I think, more important than ever. In 2015, I converted our 104-unit uh, motel into permanent supportive housing for formerly homeless veterans and chronically homeless civilians. And we've been uh, running ever since, and it's been incredibly successful, not only 
you know, in our outcomes, but also on a financial basis for our local community, because in Sonoma County, where we're based, um, the average chronically homeless individual costs our continuum of care, our community, between eighty and one hundred and eighty thousand dollars per person per year to do nothing. That's based on law enforcement interaction, inpatient hospitalization, uh, uses of crisis services, and at the Palms. It costs our local community thirteen thousand dollars per person per year to house them with all of the uh, robust services that we have on site and so we offer we have a food distribution that comes weekly we have a mobile health clinic that comes we have you know guitar sessions we have twelve aA na meetings weekly and it's really about all of these robust services it's the only thing that maintains um, housing for this very vulnerable population it's it's really easy to put somebody in housing. It's very difficult for them to be able to maintain their housing. And we've been really fortunate that we've had, um, thus far, we have a 96% uh, success rate in people maintaining their housing. And so around kind of COVID and, and our, current, our current economic situation, specifically in the hospitality industry, you know, hotel owners are hit extremely, extremely hard at the moment. And, um, there's been a lot of uh, resources that are now have been allocated with a few different programs from the governor's office with uh, Project Room Key and now Project Home or Home Key, where um, you know we have a significant amount of resources. People are realizing that, especially in you know in the Bay Area and in Northern California, it's it's extremely diff it's extremely hard and expensive to build housing, affordable housing and specifically permanent supportive housing. And uh, they're now realizing that we're able to, if we can take these, using the this POMS model of hotel conversions, motel conversions, we're able to very quickly house a very vulnerable population. And so that's been incredible to see that this has really gained support. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns is that although there is a significant amount of money that's coming down the pipeline for you know cities and counties to actually purchase properties to convert into permanent supportive housing, the thing that we need to really advocate is for um, uh, the funding funding for those supportive services because that is the only thing that maintains that housing for this vulnerable population. And I really do feel like you know the hotel owners in in California at the moment they have the ability to really have an option to to salvage their livelihoods by by you know really accepting this model and essentially pivoting because we none of us know how long um, the hospitality industry is going to be hit and this is a way for those hotel owners to maintain their business viability and also provide a social good for our most vulnerable population. And so that's why since doing the POMS model, I've created a consulting company to help replicate this model and, and explain to other hotel owners, you know, you can, this is, a, is a, a viable option for you. And I think it's been, we're really fortunate to have kind of the, the on, a, on a statewide level, the political will to help facilitate these conversions. There's been a few different things that have come down. There's now a CEQA exemption in California for specifically uh, motel conversions into permanent supportive housing, and along with the funding that is coming now from the from the state to help facilitate. My biggest concern is around making sure that these local governments, and you know, and the private owners have the sufficient funding available for those supportive services, because oftentimes there's a huge gap in that regard. For an example. Um, the housing subsidies that we use to house the veterans, they it's called a VASH voucher. And they are they're, the beauty behind the VASH voucher is that not only is the subsidy for the rental assistance for the individual, but it also comes with the funding for those supportive services that is incredibly needed to maintain that housing. Unfortunately, with the civilians, there is no such kind of dual voucher where it it pays for the subsidy, but then it also pays for those wraparound supportive services. So that's where a lot of these developments, a lot of these permanent supportive housing and affordable housing developments that use, um, that are housing a very vulnerable population, a big gap oftentimes is those supportive services. 
which is, you know, is just as important as the rental subsidies. I think one of the, the biggest challenge has been, uh, has been the mental health component of it, is having those mental health professionals on site. And unfortunately, our mental health system in its entirety in this country and even locally is severely lacking. And having those, that the professional help, you know, it's, there's a difference between having a, a case manager, a housing stabilizer to a, you know, an LCSW or a mental health professional with that clinical training. And that has really been one of the, one of the most difficult things is to have, have bring those services on site because, you know, locally we have the ability to call out for crisis intervention services, but because they're so small staffed and such, there's not enough funding there basically. Ideally what we would like to have in these permit, what I would like to have in, in all permit supportive housing developments is a mental health professional on site, you know, regularly. And that it, it's when you have to call out for a crisis intervention, I feel like it's gotten too far. And I think that that can really be, that can be significantly reduce the amount of trauma, not only for that resident, but that how that crisis creates trauma for all the other residents as well. And so if you have somebody on site, you're able to deal with those situations in a much faster way.